All right, Kyle. So uh, we just got done talking to you about the top three draft needs for San Francisco. You can find that on the RLS football channel. I'll have a link in the description of this channel for that. So you can uh, check out what you had to say. We'll talk a little bit about that, of course, in depth in this conversation anyhow. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, let's, uh, I tell you what, let, let's kind of get started with uh, what, what you thought was the top overall draft need for San Francisco um, mm -hmm. I tell you what, just before we do that, what, how does the draft capital situation look for San Francisco? How many picks do they have? Uh, the, they're actually doing fine there. They are down to nine, ten picks. Wow. They had 11. They traded one for Malik Collins. Uh, I think that's right. So it, we got, we got uh, a little bit out of sorts because they were supposed to have a third-round comp pick for Jimmy Garoppolo that wound up as a fourth-round comp pick. And then there was the whole draft compensation penalty for their overpayment in in or their their misreported payment of $75,000 in 2020. Uh so it's 9 or 10 uh I I used to have that number in my brain specifically. <laughs> they have a lot. <laughs> but no, no. That, yeah, no, lot. they're good. They 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 have a lot. It's one in the I here here I can give it to you like this. It's one in the first, one in the second, one in the third. I think they have three in the fourth. Oh. Uh one in the fifth. Two in the sixth, one in the seventh. Yeah, I think it's ten. But it sounds like the fourth. That's the big one. That's that's still a good yeah. spot to have multiple draft picks. So yeah. that to me sounds like a team when you're a Super Bowl contender and you have that much draft collateral, they're more than likely gonna try to use some of it to move up somewhere in the draft to get a more premium talent because they don't need depth, right? That they'd rather zero in on somebody that could start right away. Um, yeah, maybe I, I, I think that you can argue both sides of that for sure. Okay. Um, I, I think that, that, uh, there, I, I think there's a case to be made that they could trade back in the first, uh, in the first round, uh, from 31 down into the early second, if there's not a player that they love at 31, but, but to your point, I think what we'll see, especially, especially in the, in the middle rounds, that's typically earlier on in the draft is where they like to trade up to really target a player that they, that they like and they think can contribute uh, right away for them. Okay. Uh, but later in the draft, they tend to, it's more, you know, kind of dart throws, high upside guys. And, and, and frankly, that's how they find their Fred Warners and their George Kittles and their Dre Greenlaws and DJ okay. Jones and Brock Purdy is just throwing these darts in the late rounds. So I think, I think that's kind of the, the strategy they'll employ this year. Okay, cool. Well, you would know more than me. All right, so uh, I do have to ask you uh, defensively. So Wilkes is out, and Sorensen's in. So mm -hmm. and it, Brandon Staley's there too. So uh, what's that about? First of all, Sorensen, what kind of a defense are they going to run? The same defense they've been running for the past five or yeah. six years, or ever since Shanahan's been there, or does Sorensen change things up at all? No, I think I think they're pretty much going to be running the same the same scheme they've been running. Uh, Sorensen's been in that building. He's a fast riser in in on their coaching staff, and I think he a I think he was the guy that Shanahan kind of wanted all along, and b I think that Kyle Shanahan has a has a way that they want. Well, the team has a way they want their front seven to kind of operate within the scope of their within within the scope of their defense, and I don't think that was something that Steve Wilkes ever kind of fully got his arms around. And despite the fact Steve Wilkes did a really nice job last year, it's not it's not that that he's a terrible defensive coordinator or something. I just don't think his vision for the 49ers defense with Kyle Shanahan's vision for the 49ers defense really lined up, and I think it led to some problems, particularly in the in the second level that the 49ers just haven't had over over Kyle Shanahan's tenure. So I, I think that Sorensen has a vision that aligns more with Kyle Shanahan's comes from the Pete Carroll kind of defensive coaching tree. At least that's where he got to start under Carroll in Seattle. That's the kind of defense Kyle Shanahan wants to run. So I, I, I think we'll see uh, to the, to the naked eye. I don't think there'll be any major differences uh, on the 49ers defense this year. And yeah, cause Sorensen, he was playing uh, ball not too long ago. It seems he must be pretty young yeah. for a coach. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was very recently <laughs> in the league, kind of D'Amico Ryan's ish in the way yeah. he, in the way he kind of stepped into the coaching ranks and, and flew right. up into this position. Worked uh, for Ryan's. That's for sure. Okay. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, Staley. What's he there for? Yeah. So this is kind of interesting. I don't know if this is a stepping stone for him where he it's like image rehab. 
where he's going to come in and, and be the assistant head coach. He's going to offer some insights. I think I, I am, I'm interested to see if he's in defensive meeting rooms or offensive meeting rooms more. <laughs> okay. um, I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure if, if he's going to be a, just another voice in the defensive coaching room with, with, with Sorensen because Staley doesn't Staley comes from the Vic Fangio tree. He comes from that three, four uh, front. That's true. And, and what the Niners want to do is, is the four, three stuff. And they weren't, they weren't willing to, to budge on that. So I didn't think Staley was ever really going to be the defensive coordinator, but having a different voice in the room might be interesting. Having a different set of eyes to look at the 49ers offense and figure out how he would go about stopping that offense, I think could be could be a valuable voice for Kyle Shanahan to have. So yeah, I think I think that this is something where Brandon Staley is going to be there. He's going to have I don't think he's going to have his fingerprints like all over the defense, but I think that his voice could definitely be valuable. Like he's been a good defensive coordinator in 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 the NFL, and if he does a good job and the Niners' defense is really good, then maybe he's back in in the defensive coordinator mix yeah. um, or or in the head coach mix again soon. Yeah, like you said, he does need an image. Uh uplift no yeah, question about it tough. yeah tough going uh, la <laughs> and he was a better defensive coordinator than head coach and sometimes that's okay i mean that's just uh, no the way it is uh sometimes but like you said who knows maybe he'll get another shot he's young enough so yeah definitely okay uh now let's get back to the offense and yeah it, it looks like the offensive tackle situation is the absolute need for this team upcoming in the draft mm -hmm. and parker is just a, a fringe kind of pickup so that's yep. all that is. Uh, and McKivitz was the starter last year opposite Trent Williams. We know Williams, uh, his days are numbered. Uh, he had some injury issues last year. And it just shows you when he's not on the field, it's amazing, the drop-off. But that just also is like an indicator, isn't it, about how important it is to start adding not one, but maybe even a couple of tackles in this year's draft. Yeah, man. I mean, you look at their depth chart. It's it's Trent Williams is starting left tackle, and then Jalen Moore is the the swing tackle right now. And God love Jalen Moore. He he's played four years at Western Michigan as a left tackle, but he's like six four. He's pretty undersized. And they they drafted him to play guard, and he wound up just kind of sticking at tackle. And he's not a bad player, okay. but he's also not a starting caliber. NFL offensive tackle. Like if he has to come in for a series or two, you feel okay about it. But go look at go look at the Niners rushing numbers when Trent Williams is out versus yeah. when he was in there. And I think you get a pretty good idea of just kind of the delta between him and and more. Um and, and then on the other side, it's Colton McKivitz and and you mentioned Brandon Parker. You know, yeah, he started games at right tackle and uh it, it's that that's fine as a as a depth piece in in camp, but if your right tackle battle, and this is why we talked about earlier, the offensive tackle spot being such a huge need for them. Right now, if they went into training camp with this as their depth chart, it is Colton McKivitz versus Brandon Parker to be the starting right tackle of a team that's trying to win a Super Bowl. And I just don't think, I, I don't, I don't think that that is conducive to uh, long-term success of just throwing random darts at the, at the tackle position and hoping that one of those players rises to the top and becomes a really quality player. They're both fine. They're not bad players, but they need upgrades at that spot. And Brandon Parker is not necessarily it. So I got yeah, to go mean, through the draft. It just shows you the. this is where good coaching comes in. Good scheme is that that offensive line uh, was a player two away from winning a Super Bowl. And, yeah. uh, but you have, I'm sure, and this is why we're talking about it. They know better that, all right, we got away with it last year, but we just can't keep getting away with this. So yeah. we have to do some, especially with Williams getting older. Um, and then moving inside the guard. So Feliciano, so he's definitely entrenched as a starter, but what about the other two banks uh, and yeah. Buford uh, Burford? Is that uh, more of a contest is banks definitely the starter um, what, and what's the future uh, inside, including Brendel at safety at center, who who seemed to do a pretty decent job? Yeah, I think Banks. I think Banks has got the left guard spot locked down pretty good. He's been okay. he's been a nice add over the last couple of years. First year he didn't play much as a second round pick from Notre Dame, but the last two years he's really solidified himself on the left side of that offensive line. I think you're right. I think John Feliciano is probably the starter to, right now, but I think Spencer Burford is going to get a crack at it uh, if they draft a right tackle. I, and and that player can can start for them. Um, I think McKivitz might be in the mix at right tackle. They could also um, at right guard. 
Uh, I'm sorry, at right guard. Yeah, sorry about that. But if if somebody like in the draft, if Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon somehow slips to 31 or gets into the range where the 49ers could trade up for him and all the all the tackle prospects they like are gone, which which is sure to be the case by by the 25 to 31 range. If Jackson Powers Johnson slips into that range, it, it wouldn't shock me if they go get him to play center and and throw Brendel in into the mix at the uh, at the right guard battle. But that's going to be a spot where I think you're going to see Feliciano. You're going to see Burford. You, you might see a draft pick or two uh, in the mix there as they just try and find out who the best player is. But right now, I definitely think it's Feliciano. Okay. All right. Uh, and and Brendel, they consider him. He's, he's the guy. He's the guy that they're going to keep uh, turning to. Yeah. There's- the 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 question I, the question I have with him is he's thirty one I believe thirty or thirty one journeyman guy signed a four year deal this past off season um so and, and the Dolphins also wanted him which is why the 49ers had to shell out I think it's four years and sixteen million for him so it's not a huge deal uh, but I do think he's been fine but it's not a spot where they don't need necessarily an upgrade. Uh, so it, it, that, that wouldn't shock me at all is if a player like powers Johnson falls yeah. to them, they go that route and, um, solidify him as a long-term center while figuring out a different spot for Brendel. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I've had, uh, a bunch of discussions, uh, interviews and a, a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, analysts bring up powers Johnson's name. <laughs> it's like, wow, yeah. I guess he's a really valuable prospect who, who which tells you he's probably going to go drafted a little earlier than expected because so many teams might be interested in his you know flexibility so yeah, yeah depending on depending on the the positional value of center to teams for sure um i i think he's a really really good player a really high floor player i don't know if he necessarily has like a super high hall sure. of fame ceiling or anything but man he's a really really nice player okay uh staying on offense all right so what's up with iuke what does your gut tell you? Will you get a contract extension here? Will he be here for the next three to four years? Will he be here only one more year? Will he be traded uh, this offseason? So I believe that Brandon Ayuk is going to sign an extension with the 49ers. I think anything that comes out about, oh, trade rumors and the Niners have talked to this team, and I think all that smoke. Okay. And this is what we've seen. We've seen it with Debo Samuel. Um, we didn't see it necessarily with Nick Bosa, but Nick Bosa's holdout lasted into the first week of the regular season. Like he came back during the first week of practice leading up to the season opener in Pittsburgh. Um, George Kittle's contract negotiation went right down to the wire at the start of camp. Same thing with Fred Warner. This is just kind of what the Niners do in the timeline that they work on. Okay. And Brandon Ayuk is going to... Uh, do what he can publicly to try and uh, push the Niners and, and control the narrative uh, where he's going to, you know, delete stuff off Instagram, or you might see a trade request in here. Uh, you're going to see tweets to Mike Tomlin and he's following these Jaguars players on Instagram. You're going to see, you're going to see all that. But I, I think at the end of the day, unless here's the, my one caveat on this, I think the Niners get a deal done unless I, you want something like $35 million a year. Or some some wild number okay. that the forty the 49ers will have a number in mind. Let's let's call it thirty just to just for a round number. Let's say the 49ers have thirty million dollars in mind. The only way they're trading Ayuk is if his hard number is above that thirty million. And at, at that point they'll move him. But we'll know. I, I think we'd know by now. But I, I think we'll know by the draft if that's something they plan on doing. And I don't think they do. I think they believe that they can come to a deal. They've done it with all their other star players. Um, if I'm a, you know, if I'm a 49er fan who just bought a Brandon Ayuk jersey or something, I'm not necessarily worried about it just yet. And uh, you believe that he's the type of guy that understands that. Look, w- what's a few million extra dollars a year when I can hang? I can be on a team that is a legitimate Super Bowl contender every year. I mean, mm-hmm. he's that type of guy that you think that is more inclined to understand that. Uh, yeah, 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 I think so. And, and I think too, if you're the 49ers to put some of the onus on them, I, I'm of the mind that they have to extend Ayuk. If you're going to pay Brock Purdy this off season or next, whenever they're going to pay him, if you're going to pay him in the Dak Prescott, Daniel Jones, Matthew Stafford, 40 million a year range or North of that, 
you need to pair him with a good young receiver oh, yeah. because Debo Samuel doesn't have a ton of years left. George Kittle doesn't have a ton of years left. Over the next five, six years, Brandon Ayuk could be the number one option in your offense. Uh, and in five or six years, you're not going to have George Kittle, Christian McCaffrey, and Debo Samuel on your team. So yep. um, to me, to me, it's a no-brainer. You, you sign Ayuk, and I think it's the onus is on the 49ers to kind of pitch it to him like, look, you were seventh in the league in receiving this year, uh, despite being, I think he was 35th or 38th in targets. Uh, over the next couple of years, those targets are going to uptick, and you're just going to more firmly supplant yourself as the number one option, the number one receiving option uh, in this offense. And I think that is what would entice him. Uh, Brandon Ayuk is is a great player. I think he knows he's a great player. Uh, I think he just wants to make sure he's getting the opportunity to showcase that as much as possible. And I think that opportunity, maybe it's not there in 2024, but you look at 2025, 2026, 2027, those are all Brandon Ayuk years. All right. Now, I know the team doesn't use a lot of, or they don't run a lot of uh, 11 personnel, but mm -hmm. still, you know, you see on the depth chart, the RLS.com depth chart, Jennings and Ronnie Bell at the slot, both mm -hmm. seventh round draft picks, interesting enough. But mm -hmm. are they are they okay with that? And, and even the depth overall, because Gray was a third round pick, but we haven't heard anything from him in a couple of years. So do they think that they need another receiver? And it's a very deep receiver class. Do you expect mm -hmm. that they'll add a receiver in this draft? Yeah. In the, in the universe where Brandon Ayuk doesn't get traded, I still think they they go find a receiver, particularly one if, if that receiver can return kicks. That would be, that would be a bonus. Um, but I think they really like Ronnie Bell. He, he had a really effective preseason and he contributed a little bit in the regular season, but uh, Juwan, Juwan Jennings is stud. And I think they really want to keep him around. They, they put the second round restricted free agent tender on him. It wouldn't shock me if they come to uh, some kind of, you know, two or three year deal in the kind of Zay Jones type of range with him okay. where, uh, I mean, he's just, what he does as a blocker, he blocks like a tight end. He is a reliable go-to target for Brock Purdy. I mean, he was, if the Niners had held on to win the Super Bowl, there was a chance Jawan Jennings was going to be the Super Bowl MVP. He was he was that good in that game. So I, I think they want to keep him around. Yeah, and then Ronnie Bell is fine. I, I would be I would be shocked, but I'd be a I I'd be a little surprised if Danny Gray was even on the roster uh, okay. this year. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, all that is to say, I I do think that they're going to go uh, get a receiver. Uh, maybe it's day two. Um, I would I would guess day three where they try and go find a player at that spot. Okay. And tight end. So we talked about this on the other video yeah. and they were not able to get Brock right. Detroit matched. So mm -hmm. th that's the deal. But it's interesting because again, you wouldn't know this unless you're dialed in as a San Francisco analyst like yourself that yeah, just because they drafted a couple of guys last year, including one in the third round, that doesn't mean that they're satisfied with what's going on with that depth chart, yeah. which is why they went after Brock Wright. And especially for a team that likes to run a lot of 22 uh, personnel, uh, meaning multiple tight ends, that mm -hmm. that's an important uh, part of the roster. So um, you think there's someone else out there, another veteran, uh, or you think this is it now they've exhausted their veteran possible deals and now they go into the draft and possibly add another player there. Yeah. They, they may go get a veteran. I think on the last video we talked about Ross Dwelly, like Ross Dwelly is just kind of there. And if they, if they really feel like they need a tight end, they can go get him. There may be another free agent that they like. Um, but I just don't think they, they can go into this year confidently thinking that Cameron Latu and Braden Willis are, are enough at the tight end position. Uh, even, even if they, even if Kyle Shanahan said, Hey, we're going to scrap a bunch of our, our 22 personnel stuff and our 12 personnel stuff. And we're just going to go a lot of single tight end. I, I, even then you just don't know what you're going to get. You don't know if these are good or bad NFL players yet, yeah. where if you lose George Kittle, are you just, you just don't have a tight end anymore. Yeah. A, a, yeah. A credible tight end. So, yeah. so to me, that's why I, I put that there. I, I said it was their third biggest draft need. There, there are six things you could list as their third biggest draft need. But to me, sure. when you look at this depth chart and you're going, man, what are they going to use an early pick on it, it, it? To me, if there's, if there's a player you like in the second round that you think can, can not only block at the NFL level right away, but, but can contribute a little bit as a pass catcher uh, because that's really the wrinkle they've been missing not to get too deep into the weeds, but um, that's the wrinkle they've been missing out of their 22 personnel 
is Charlie Werner and Ross Dwelly were not pass catching threats. I think Charlie Werner in four years had 11 catches for 120 yards and he didn't have a touchdown. Wow. Like that's just not, that's just, so when they run 22, it's like, okay, you don't have to guard the second tight end. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that. They're probably not going to pass out of it. Whereas if you suddenly find a tight end this year in the second round that you're going, Hey, not only can this guy block, but we think we he can, he can catch it a little bit and contribute as a receiver. I think that's why they wanted Brock, right? Frankly. And now all of a sudden teams have to not only worry about what the Niners are doing in 22 on, on the ground, but now all of a sudden, yeah, Hey, they might just drop back and throw it because this tight end is, is, is a problem in the, in the passing game as well. All right. So that is a definite possibility because there are going to be a, a couple of pretty good tight end prospects that uh, could yeah. be. Now, again, a lot's going to depend. Um, and who knows, maybe like you said before, maybe they trade down um, because if they go after a tight end, maybe that's not their first pick. Uh, it mm-hmm. could be, well, maybe it is their first, but if we trade down and we get that guy somewhere in the early second rounds, instead of one of the last picks of the first round, it might be a better mm-hmm. spot. Um, but who knows? Uh, maybe the right tight end is there and they go for that player with their first pick. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as the rest of the offense, I think everything looks pretty uh, like it's going to be locked in, right? Because Patrick Taylor was just signed. So it looks like they're deep at running back. Uh, Dobbs is now their backup along with Allen. So the rest of the offense looks pretty good, right? There's uh, no reason to think that they're going to do anything drastic uh, the rest of the off season. No, I don't. I don't think so. There's going to be uh, little fringe signings like Patrick Taylor. They might add another, another uh, safety on the defensive side, but offensively specifically, I got to just sidebar real quick. Okay. It's been so nice not having to talk about quarterbacks this off season. <laughs> it was so yeah. many off seasons in a row, but what are they going to do with Jimmy? What about Trey Lance? What about the, it's like, no man, Brock Purdy's a healthy he's the starter. No, this is great. It's so yeah. nice. I'm sure it is. <laughs> we'll change uh, the Yeah. Uh, all right, so on defense, uh, you talked about a big need, and that's uh, edge. Uh, you got Bosa, of course. Uh, but Leonard Floyd was brought in. It's not mm-hmm. like he's a young pup, but you know it's a nice signing. Gross Matos, that's not an edge. That's not a guy that you envision as he's going to disrupt the quarterback. So mm-hmm. um, I can see what you're talking about because Drake Jackson was a second round draft pick, and he hasn't really uh, panned out. Beal is young. We'll see what happens there. Uh, so, uh, this could be, you think, a, a definitely possibility as uh, one of their top picks, if not their top pick. Yeah. Yeah. Given the, just more, more, not that Nick Bosa and, and Leonard Floyd with Yuder Gross Matos and then another, another player is a, is a bad rotation of defensive ends. But this is a spot that, like I, like I said a while back, the, before the 49ers drafted Nick Bosa, they tried to trade for Khalil Mack. And in discussing that, John Lynch, said that they view the defensive end as they equate the importance of a pass rushing disruptive defensive end. They equate that to on defense to a very good quarterback on offense like that. That is how much they value this position. And if you're going to build your defense around a a deep, uh, relentless, very good pass rush, I don't think that what they have at that position right now is enough. Yep. And that's that's where, to me, it wouldn't shock me at all. You know, we sit here and we talk offensive tackle and they need this and they need that. It wouldn't shock me at all if they're, if that coaching staff in that front office is sitting there going, looking at this defensive end depth chart uh, and going, hey, this isn't this isn't enough. Yeah, uh, we got to We got to go find a guy early in the draft who we think can contribute this year. Makes a lot of sense. All right. Inside Collins was acquired via trade. Uh, Hargrave, uh, one of the better interior uh, pass rushers there is. Mm-hmm. Ellie brought in from Cleveland. So uh, there's new guys, of course. And matter of fact, it's interesting because you got Collins is new, Elliott's new. Uh, mm-hmm. Even if you want to talk about the edge, just on the defensive line, you got a couple other guys that we just talked about. And then you also have um, players that were lost. Armstead, Young, Kinlaw, mm-hmm. Joseph, Farrell. So a lot of turnover there up front. But just getting back to the middle, even though they have Collins and Hargrave, a couple of veterans, Elliot hasn't shown much in Cleveland. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that's just more of change of scenery, body, you know, we depth guy. Sure. Do you think yeah. that you're going to add someone maybe in the middle rounds here just to add some more young depth? This is, an, this is, this is another spot where it wouldn't shock me if they, if they drafted a player early. Okay. Uh, Jim Hargrave was good last year, but definitely a little bit disappointing. Um, Malik Collins, a, a good player, but if you can, find somebody that 
uh, maybe not start, but is a heavy, heavy contributor in year one. I don't think the 49ers are are above taking a defensive tackle, especially if somebody like like Jerjon Newton from Illinois falls to them or falls into a range where they can comfortably trade up. If for whatever reason, Texas defensive lineman Byron Murphy slides, uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they go trade up for him. In fact, in the last NFL Wire Network mock draft, that's exactly what I did. Um, that, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Cause you're right. Like that's a fine little rotation there, but, um, are, are, are you willing to bet your season on? Yeah. Kevin Givens and Jordan Elliott as, yeah. as key rotation guys in the middle. I mean, maybe, may, maybe, but uh, that's definitely a question mark, a, a big enough question mark for me, uh, at, a, at an important spot on this roster to, to believe that. Yeah, day three for sure, but if they went earlier than that, it, it wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. Okay. Uh, linebacker, so the big change, uh, Campbell uh, comes in, and um, uh, you look at uh, his career has been up and down, yeah. um, and he's up there in age, uh, but what do you think about, uh, at this point, there's other needs the team has. So it's just, just one of them where, yeah, Campbell's probably just going to fit in nicely for a year, and they'll worry about adding someone maybe either late in the draft or if this is something for next offseason. Yeah, so I think they knew they needed a starter because Dre Greenlaw tore his ACL in the in the Super Bowl, or I'm sorry, uh, tore his Achilles in the Super Bowl, and he wants to be back by week one. John Lynch didn't sound as optimistic about that, and I'd be pretty surprised myself if he was back for week one. So I think right. Devondre Campbell, he's a former All Pro. Even when he hasn't been an all pro, he's been a bit of fine player. I think you stick him next to Fred Warner uh, as the will linebacker to start the season. You're doing okay. And then he's a super all, uh, overqualified Sam linebacker once Dre Greenlaw, if, if Dre Greenlaw is back in the mix this year. Uh, so I think that was a nice add uh, because it, it fills kind of two holes at once. It gives you a starter while Greenlaw's out. And then that, that third linebacker who, who's not on the field a ton in base with the 49ers, uh, but they just have an overqualified, really good player there when Greenlaw does come back. Um, and then as far as, as this year's draft goes, I think they like D Winters. I think they like Jalen Graham, the seventh round pick from Purdue last year. Okay. And, and I think they're going to, I think they're going to give those guys legitimate shots to, to contribute right away, particularly at that Sam linebacker spot while, while Dre Greenlaw is out. And if they perform well, uh, and, and you know, Devondre Campbell leaves after this season, then the Niners know they have a they have a good player to um, to start ushering in a, a new era in the second level. Okay, and who do you think has the biggest upside? Do you know uh, between Winters and uh, Graham, or it's still too early? It, it, it's it, the biggest upside is probably Graham, but if you told me that one of them contributed this year for sure, I think I'd probably bet on Winters. Okay. And in the secondary, uh, I, I definitely want to ask you about this because obviously Gibson uh, mm -hmm. is a free agent and he was a big part of that secondary. So uh, what's going to go on there right now? Is, what, what do you think the plan is? Is the plan to uh, go into the draft and see if they can add another player there? And and what, mm -hmm. are they, what are they like with the combo there of Afonga and Brown? And if they think that uh, maybe there's just an uptick in snaps for both of those guys. Yeah, I think it's that. I think I think it, at the safety spot specifically, Talano Hufanga tore his ACL in week 11. Uh, they're anticipating him being back in during training camp. So that should get him ready for week one. That's their starting duo for sure. I think they might uh, draft somebody or maybe sign a, a kind of a lower level free agent just to give themselves some depth at safety. Although Taylor Hawkins, that undrafted rookie uh, from a couple of years ago, he was uh, he had a really, really nice camp. And I know, I know that Steve Wilkes liked him a lot. I'm, I'm not sure if, if uh, Nick Sorensen and co will, will like him as much, but it wouldn't shock me if he made the roster at, at all, just as a, as a reserve and a special teams contributor at corner. It's Traverius Ward for sure. Um, lock it in all pro Diamond Lenore had a really nice season. He can play in the slot or outside that third corner spot. Huge question mark. Okay. Uh, you have Ambry Thomas listed as a as the as the starter on our lads. I think that's probably right if I had to bet today. Um, Darrell Luter, though, uh, fifth round pick last year, is going to get is going to get a, a real opportunity. I think Samuel Womack, a fifth round pick from a couple years ago, he's going to get a real opportunity to compete. And this is where I think corner is a need for the 49ers in the draft. But it wouldn't shock me if it's not super high on their priority list. 
The okay. earliest they've picked a quarterback in the Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch era is 66th overall. And that was in 2017 when they took Akella Witherspoon. Outside of that, the earliest they've taken a cornerback is 102 overall. And that was Ambry Thomas. So it's a position that because of their reliance on the front seven, they don't put a ton of resources into the secondary. So I think what we're going to see is that group of players I just mentioned duke it out for the the outside corner job uh, opposite Traverius Ward. And then they'll draft a player at some point, maybe maybe late day two, maybe maybe in day three, that, that they think can come in and compete, contribute on special teams, and maybe compete for a starting job, just because that's kind of how they've operated as a position over the last few years. And there will be a battle to see uh, which player on the roster is, is capable of, of uh, starting opposite Traverius Ward. All right. Excellent. Before I let you go, uh, Kyle, anything on special teams that they set? I know we know the whole Jake Moody thing, but at this point, hey, at least he made his last kick, right? Um, that, and I'm a Michigan fan, so uh, I, I didn't really expect Moody was going to have this much difficulty, but I do think he's mentally tough enough that um, that maybe the kick, uh, his last kick might help him out, uh, have, a, have a really good season, a really good career. But you're a Niner fan. You know what's going on there. So w- w- what do you think is up with the sec- with the uh, special teams? Yeah, man. Uh, Mitch Wisnowski is one of the best punters in the league. Tabor Pepper, terrific. Jake Moody, it, it was kind of a joke on on my, my podcast just kind of throughout the year. Um, just him being the 99th overall pick in last year's draft. But look, bottom line is, did he miss a, a couple of big kicks during the year? 100%. But he also was nails in the biggest game of the year. He was so good in the Super Bowl and kicked two go-ahead kicks <laughs> yeah. um, in, in the final two minutes and overtime of the Super Bowl. Like That's just that's big-time stuff. Uh, I think he solidified himself. I don't think there's any worry there. All right. Sounds good. Uh, excellent. Kyle, as always, uh, again, uh, you are still managing editor of the Niners wire as long, as long as you know. Uh, yeah. and, uh, when are you on the air? Do you have a regular show yourself? Yeah. Yeah. 10, 10 AM to noon Pacific time, ESPN, 1320.com, uh, well, ESPN, 1320, if you happen to be in Northern California. Um, but, uh, if you're, if you're checking it out online, uh, 1320.com we're also streaming live on youtube youtube.com slash espn 1320 yeah and we're going to de- definitely make sure that uh we provide as usual the link in the description area so you can check awesome. out all of those spots real quickly and uh can't wait to use your information for our live draft tonight Sounds so when I, when I when i sit back and wait and see what they whoever it is that has this niners pick i'm just gonna go oh, okay really you think so all right <laughs> i got i got something for you so uh i appreciate Perfect. that kyle and uh, look forward great. to talking to you again after the draft. Uh, definitely. We'll find out what's going on. Uh, Cause uh, Hey, you know what, when you've uh, come that close to winning the Super Bowl, uh at this point in time, I mean, it's all about kind of just trying to put a couple of spots, you know, caress a couple of spots in the depth chart yeah. to see if you can get over the hump. So, yep, no doubt. I'm sure uh, they know what they're doing, you know, and uh, it, must be, so. it must be good to be a Niners fan right now, actually, to tell you the truth. So yeah, they're in a pretty, pretty good spot for sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Greg.